So Rick and Morty Season 6 Episode 6 really caught my attention. It centers around the return of the dinosaurs, who are actually a technologically advanced spacefaring species that left Earth millennia ago to help other planets advance. Dinosaurs are back! Monkeys went bald? Upon their return, they are surprised that the monkeys have become the new apex species and tell humanity, Now that we're back, we can respectfully take it from here. They quickly elevate the people of Earth to a life of post-scarcity, jobs are abolished, and people spend their free time doing whatever they please. But there's a problem. The conflict-adjusted humans are… bored. I can't even pretend to feel useful in a game! This is how humanity's story ends? Relieved of duty and sat at the kids' table? Free from the shackles of capitalism and the daily grind, the president complains that At first it was fun spending all day watching whatever YouTube autoplays after the last one autoplayed, but a man can only watch so many ads for Grammarly. So he asks Rick to coo the dinos and put humans back in charge, all in exchange for Rick getting to host the Oscars. It's a weird episode, but it did get me thinking, what does post-scarcity do to the human psyche? If we turn to the show for answers, post-scarcity seems like a pretty bad thing. Not only do the Smiths end up hating their new life, but look at Rick himself, a man with the powers of a god who can do anything, go anywhere, and yet struggles with a deep sense of meaninglessness. Despite the hedonistic pleasure-seeking of his exterior, Rick's post-scarce power level has left him a deeply unhappy man. When everyone is brought up to Rick's level in this episode, Rick points out that he's been living this way for years now, mocking them for how unhappy and useless they feel. Oh come on dad, you don't hate this too? Why would I? I, I was already doing what I wanted. And while he plays this off like if he's perfectly well adjusted, we know that's not the case. Even worse, he compares them to Jerry, their long-term unemployed punching bag of a father. I do think it's kind of funny that you're all basically Jerry now. Fuck. Post-scarcity hasn't elevated humanity to new heights, it's made everybody Jerry. This cynical portrayal of post-scarcity is pretty unique among sci-fi shows. I'm no expert, but compare it to a series like Star Trek, where post-scarcity is a utopian state of affairs, this seems like it was written by some hardcore MAGA Republicans as an indictment of socialist ideals, which I'm pretty sure Dan Harmon and the team behind the episode aren't, and I don't think we should interpret it that way. The episode includes plenty of critiques of our hyper-consumerist capitalist hellscape, and the return of capitalism has less to do with post-scarcity failing and more to do with the President of the United States craving power again, which yeah, the US cooing a socialist regime is pretty on brand. But still, there's a lot here, and to see what post-scarcity does to the human psyche, I think it's worth looking into what regular scarcity does first. So we live in a hyper-consumerist society, or in other words, a society where we value the consumption of goods beyond one's necessities and we enforce the associated pressures to consume those goods. In the 21st century, hyper-consumerism has become the main guiding force that defines most of our lives. It mediates not just our jobs, but our personal identities and the ways in which we relate to others. Our things become symbols with which we show the world who we are. Now if you want a video essay on hyper-consumerism and all the negatives associated with it, this is not it. But it is important to acknowledge it as foundational to life in contemporary capitalism, because it gives us a pretty good analog to life under post-scarcity. Hyper-consumerism isn't post-scarcity, but for the most wealthy who can get anything they damn well please, it's the closest thing we got. And we have some research that shows what wealth does to the human mind. Unfortunately for us, it's not very good. A number of studies observing behavioral and personality differences between the rich and poor have found that wealth is at odds with empathy and compassion, with working class people, for example, being better at reading facial expressions than their bourgeois counterparts, or deriving more happiness in connecting with others than in feeling self-centered emotions like pride. Not only do the wealthy tend to be less empathetic and more self-centered, they also demonstrate a remarkable sense of entitlement. 
as one Berkeley study showed that drivers of luxury cars were four times less likely than those in less expensive vehicles to stop and allow pedestrians the right of way. They were also more likely to cut off other drivers. Those are some pretty bad findings, but whether it's affluence itself that's the reason is hard to say. But another study that randomly distributed uneven amounts of fake money to players in a game of Monopoly found that the richer players behaved more aggressively than their poorer counterparts, suggesting that it could be money itself that's the problem, even when it's Monopoly money. And when you acknowledge that money reduced to its most basic essence is power or a means to get other people to do things for you, the increased entitlement, recklessness, and aggression makes sense. Which makes post-scarcity seem pretty unappealing if we'd all become rich assholes. We really could all become hedonistic pricks going from one drug-fueled orgy to another like Rick, since surprise surprise, affluence is also linked to a number of addiction problems, as well as high rates of mental disturbances like depression and anxiety. If living in a post-scarce society means living like this, uh, I'm good. I'll take that Protestant work ethic, thank you. But there's reasons to be hopeful. Being affluent in a capitalist society is pretty different from being affluent in a society where everyone is affluent. For example, the entitlement that comes from having money, power, and clout might be reduced in a world where no one can be compelled to do things because they need money. Some of the negative outcomes associated with wealth might come from hyper-consumerist capitalist culture and the dogged pursuit of wealth at all costs. Removing factors like ruthless competition among enterprises, the profit incentive, and wealth as a status symbol might help change this culture for the better. Of course, we don't know this for a fact. But I think a big reason the show's creators decided to depict post-scarcity so negatively is the premise was, what if humans were thrust into post-scarcity utopia overnight? Not, what if humans slowly transitioned into it over decades? Not only would the first scenario never happen in real life, but this abrupt shift is what I believe would be the main problem, not post-scarcity itself. I actually kind of agree with the show in that humans would have one hell of a time adapting to a post-scarce way of life. So much so, I don't doubt a reactionary backlash could occur with people demanding we go back to the ways of capitalism. I mean, monarchists exist today who want to reinstate the authority of kings and queens, so don't underestimate human stupidity. One of the main driving forces behind this backlash, I believe, would be boredom due to our fucked up relationship with the concept of leisure. Workers in countries like the United States are infamously overworked and very short in free time. You'd think that the obvious antidote would be less work and more free time. But numerous headlines have proclaimed, too much leisure is actually bad for you, citing studies that find that both people with too little free time and too much free time are less happy than people with some medium amount of ideal free time. Which seems like a pretty big nail in the coffin for a world where all time becomes free time. But there's a huge angle this coverage on leisure studies overlooks. Leisure can broadly be divided into two categories, productive or unproductive. Productive leisure could be exercising, exploring, learning a new skill, connecting with friends, basically anything that requires planning or active conscious participation on your part. Even something as passive as watching a movie can be considered productive if you're gonna write about it or talk about it later with friends. Unproductive leisure, on the other hand, is the kind we're way too familiar with. It's the mindless scrolling on social media, binging on TV, the sort of catatonic leisure you fall into after a long day of work. Remember the president watching YouTube auto-repeat? That's unproductive leisure. And when you separate the two kinds of leisure, then the association between high leisure time and unhappiness goes away. When you spend your free time doing productive, fulfilling things, more free time does not worsen your mental well-being, it only enhances it. The kicker here is many of us don't know how to live with free time. Again, a lot of us are overworked, spending most of our lives employed in jobs where our time quite literally does not belong to us. Others have a work-focused mindset where they either consciously or subconsciously 
view leisure as wasteful. And since mindless leisure is so easy to fall into, a lot of us don't have the tools to thrive when we own our time. Life under post-scarcity, where a capitalist doesn't own 9 hours of your day, would be a huge shock to the majority of us. Combine it with an overnight transition, and yeah, I think many people would struggle with finding meaning under post-scarcity. We actually see a variation of this struggle with the titular protagonist. As a science god whose whole life is leisure, Rick struggles with meaninglessness. But over the seasons, the show again and again has shown us that the one thing that keeps him from spiraling off the deep end is his connections to his family. Well, really, mostly Morty, but I guess the others too. And while he might not like how much he cares for them, feelings of connectedness and activities that enhance your connectedness with others are some of the most fulfilling things you can do with your life. Of course, with our atomized society of loneliness, this is difficult. But the solution is quite simple. Me and you, our children, and our children's children will never live in this utopian society of post-scarcity where no one works. We have the means to meet everyone's basic needs today, but that still would require a lot of us to work, making food, building goods, homes, and so on. The transition to a world where technology can take care of all human needs is so far away into the future that humanity and capitalist culture will have a long time to be reformed into something new. We'll have as long as it takes to develop this technology to unlearn the old ways and embrace a society where we're the masters of our time. That is, if climate catastrophe doesn't take us out first. But what do you think? Let me know in the comments down below.